you also uh, ride 120 miles a week on a bicycle. Have you thought about how much higher the stock price would be if you didn't spend those, that time on the 120 miles a week? I'm thinking I should start riding 200 a week. Wow, okay, all right, well, if I, would I look like you if I could drink the Diet Mountain Dew? You, sure. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the space program. This is the most exciting time in, uh, in our country's space program in decades. So you grew up in Iowa. Every morning I had to milk cows. Have you ever said to them, drink some Mountain Dew and they, the cows will produce more? Or... Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. Just Don't leave it, it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist, and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? Since you've been the CEO, the market capitalization of the company is up uh, about 100%. The stock price is up about 140%. Yet you also uh, ride 120 miles a week on a bicycle. Have you thought about how much higher the stock price would be, or the market cap, if you didn't spend those, that time on the 120 miles a week in bike riding? Well, I, I have thought about that. And uh, actually, I ride uh, closer to 140 a week. 140? Yeah, and, and with that correlation, I'm thinking, I should start writing 200 a week. Wow, okay, all right, well. Um, so, does, I mean, riding bikes, I, I've done probably 10 miles in my lifetime, maybe something like that. But, but um, so isn't it dangerous? I mean, they have key man insurance on you, you're an important person. Well, I, I ride more than uh, 10,000 miles a year, so I'm uh, safety conscious. and. Uh, you know, that's uh, a well-honed skill. And you know, one of the things we take pride in at our company is our, is our safety record. And I try to apply the same thing when I'm riding. And it's a great way to uh, relax and think. And uh, frankly, I think uh, taking time to exercise and, and ride my bike uh, you know, makes me better as a leader. And I try to encourage that in our team as well. When did you take this up? Uh, as a young man, or you're always interested in this? Yeah, I've been riding for uh, probably 20, 25 years. Seriously, uh, I often travel with my bike and I can drum up some uh, Boeing riders at almost any one of our sites. And we hand out Boeing jerseys. It's a great way to get out with the team. Engage. Any of them ever go faster than you or they're not allowed to do that? <laughs> some try, try, some try. Are they still with the company or? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I like a challenge. Okay. Um, one other thing that I found unusual in reading about you is that um, you seem to be fueled by Diet Mountain Dew. Mm. You drink enormous amounts it of it. It is one of my favorite drinks. Yeah. So you have some here. Yeah. Um, uh, is there something in it that I don't know about? But, I, mean, what, look, I mean, if I, would I look like you if I could drink the Diet Mountain Dew? You, sure. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, hey, it's, good. It's, it's a good energizer for me. You serve those uh, everywhere at Boeing. I assume they have that. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, the company you're, you're leading now. Uh, the company is an extraordinary uh, success story. Started by Mr. Boeing many, many years ago. The company is how old now? We're 102 years this year. So we celebrated our centennial 2016. We did a, a big uh, celebration event at the uh, Red Barn facility, which is where the Boeing company started back in 1916. Okay, so the company is in very, very good shape. The government is spending more money in aerospace defense than before. Um, people are flying more than they are. So. Can it get any better than this? Well, I tell you what, this is a really strong marketplace. When I look at big industrial markets around the world, aerospace market, I think, is the strongest. And one of the big drivers behind that is, is the population that's now entering the middle class and has the ability to fly. You know, we have a, 100 million new passengers every year in Asia, new passengers. And uh, our estimates are that less than 20% of the world's population has even taken a single flight. So, tremendous growth opportunity ahead. And then, as you said, strengthen the defense budget as well. Uh, the tax bill was passed, mm -hmm. and it's a big tax cut for a lot of corporations. And you were uh, one of the companies that I think benefited from it, and maybe yeah. were pushing for this tax cut. So, what are you going to do with all the extra money that you have? 
So we uh, plowed a lot of those savings back into innovation and R&D, and uh, we spend billions of dollars every year on R&D investment here in the U.S. And another big thing we did is uh, immediately upon passage of the bill, we announced an investment of $300 million in our workforce and workplace. So that includes $100 million in uh, training for our employees, $100 million in infrastructure for the future, workspaces, and then $100 million in uh, community giving, which is perhaps the most okay. important part of that. And uh, that $100 million in community giving, uh, in fact, today, uh, we're going to be announcing the fact that uh, we're identifying 54 million of specific grants and we're adding another $5 million to our investment in the Kennedy well, Center. Thank you very All much. of that is being announced. It. Okay, today. well, if, uh, if, you, if you ever need tickets to Hamilton, call me. <laughs> Deal. 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 Okay, so let's talk about how uh, a farm boy from Iowa became the head of Boeing. So you grew up in Iowa. I did, right? up in uh, Northwest Iowa, just outside of a little town called Sioux Center, and uh, grew up on a farm, working on my dad's farm. What kind of farm was it? Well, we had a large uh, crop farm. Mostly uh, we raised uh, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, and we had a lot of livestock, uh, cattle, pigs, chickens. So you, you were milking cows and everything? Every morning I had to milk cows. We, uh, we uh, milked our own cows for for our family's uh, consumption. So that was part of my daily chores in the morning. And have you ever said to them, drink some Mountain Dew and they, the cows will produce more, or cows will be more productive or something? Uh, yeah, no. that, that wasn't part of the diet plan oh, when okay. I was a kid, yeah. All right, so you went to Iowa State. I did. And Iowa State, you, man, uh, you majored in uh, aeronautical engineering? Aerospace engineering. Okay, so were there a lot of people doing that there? Yeah, it's, it's, it was at that time uh, one of the larger aerospace engineering schools in the country, continues to be. Uh, it does have some uh, Boeing connections too. T.A. Wilson, who was one of, uh, one of uh, Boeing's previous CEOs, uh, he uh, went to Iowa State. And uh, I actually, uh, when I went there, managed somehow to get his uh, scholarship. And uh, that led to an opportunity for a Boeing internship. So between my junior and senior years at uh, Iowa State. I did an internship at Boeing in Seattle, and I got hooked. Okay. And uh, been there ever since. Well, you, you got a master's degree at the University of Washington. Was that while you were working at Boeing? Yeah, yeah, okay. that was uh, part of uh, Boeing's education while you work okay. plan. Yeah. What was it that enabled you to rise up among all those employees to be the CEO? Yeah. You're implying it's hard to tell, right? Well, no. <laughs> I just want to give you a chance to tell everybody what I already know. <laughs> well, it, David, you know, frankly, um, I, I never worried too much about that. So I was thrilled to go work at the world's best aerospace company. Okay. I wanted to be a great designer of airplanes. I had the chance to work with a lot of great teams along the way. And I always tried to you know, find the hardest things to work on and just concentrate on knocking that job out of the park. Okay. And that may not sound like much of a career strategy, but it, it worked, worked okay. out. Okay, so at a very young age, you were put in charge of running a program for Boeing where they were trying to get the Joint Strike uh, Fighter yep. uh, contract, which is the biggest contract the Pentagon's ever given. Ultimately, it went to another company called yep. Lockheed Martin. Yep. Uh, so you lost. When you lost, did you think your career was over? No, and, and it really wasn't even my uh, you know, construct around that program. But in four years, we went from roughly a, a clean sheet of paper to flying two X-32 prototypes. And uh, clearly disappointed that in the end we didn't win, but I learned a lot as a leader. And you know, sometimes when things don't work out, you, you learn even more. I can tell you that the technology benefit from that program, the talent benefit, how those people then subsequently spread out to the rest of Boeing, you know, it created a benefit that's lasted for, uh, okay. for decades. Early in the administration, uh, President Trump said that the Air Force One plane was too expensive. And he wasn't happy with the cost of it. Um, he got your attention, I guess. We're, uh, we're proud of the fact that we uh, build and support Air Force One. It's a really important mission. Uh, the airplanes that are flying today are old 747-200s, uh, actually delivered under uh, George H.W. Bush's administration. They're that old. Oldest 747s flying, and uh, we're proud to keep them flying. And so the, uh, the two new 747-8s, uh, the latest version of the 747, were uh, just procured, and those will be modified and become the new uh, Air Force One over the next few years. So did you convince him to take up bike riding when you were in Mar-a-Lago? <laughs> he, uh, he, he didn't seem like that interested in that. Hey, well, he, is, he has his own hobby set, okay. and we, right. uh, <laughs> we, uh, we respect each other's hobbies. Okay, all right.
So what about <laughs> supersonic transport? Um, yeah. Remember, there was a plane uh, yeah. called the Concorde. Well, it's, it's the economic hurdle that goes with it. That airplane was never economically viable on its own, but we'll see high-speed airplanes that can connect any two cities in the world in about two hours. And then we'll see that span up to uh, space tourism. You'll see an intersection between commercial air travel, high-speed travel, and space travel. And uh, that's all going to evolve over the next couple of decades. Airbus is your main competitor, is that right? Yeah. And in the commercial airplane. Commercial air, air, yep. airspace. Have you ever tested out any Airbuses? I've, I've flown on them. Uh, you know, it's not something I spend a lot of time pursuing. Okay. Uh, but uh, I, would, I would suggest if you were to, you know, survey the crowd, people that have flown on both Airbus and Boeing, generally the reports I hear, people like flying on a Boeing airplane. All right, well, let's see. Uh, how many people here prefer Boeing? Okay, okay. I guess, I, I guess you're right on that. Now, um, they uh, and you have had a, what some people might call a duopoly, which is really two manufacturers. Um, are you not worried that the Chinese or the Japanese will ultimately get into this business of making uh, commercial airplanes? Well, we, we know that future competitors are coming, without question. And, uh, you know, the great thing is we have a very strong marketplace. It's about a $7.6 trillion marketplace over the next 10 years. It's a growing industrial marketplace. Uh, it's a marketplace that creates manufacturing jobs and technology ripple benefit. Uh, China is clearly emerging as a very important commercial market for us. They are also a future competitor. So the, the art of this business is to collaborate and compete. And you know, competition is going to make us better. The point that the world is pursuing the aerospace market uh, just causes us to continue to invest in innovation. We win because we continue to invest in innovation. You want a big contract to, to produce air tank. These are refueling uh, planes that yeah. enable our planes to be refueled. But it's behind schedule or not? Well, we've had some challenges in the development program, so we're behind the original schedule, but we are uh, on the cusp now of delivery, so I'm, I'm excited to see this happen. Explain this how it works. You're flying along on an airplane, and you have another plane coming along that's going to uh, refuel it. How hard is it to get that little thing in there? Um, For combat operations or Air Force operations, obviously the skill of the pilot, the receiver of the fuel, is important, and then the new advanced systems on the new tanker assist with that. So the refueling boom is more than 50 feet long. It extends out of the back of the airplane. It has wings on it, so you actually fly it. And there's an operator inside the tanker that flies the boom to the airplane and makes the connection. We've done you know, more than uh, 2,500 connections during the test program already. Okay. So that's part of certifying the tanker. Do you make the F-15? F-15 right? Eagle, yeah. Okay. Have you ever been in that plane? Or? I have. I've, uh, I've had a couple of flights in the F-15 Eagle, back seat, right, so flying with a Boeing pilot. Uh, but I've uh, had a chance to fly in the F-15 Eagle and in our F-18 uh, Super Hornet. Uh, I've and flown an Apache helicopter, a few others too. That's one of the great parts of this job, is I occasionally get to fly. So when they do a barrel roll, yeah. what is that like? Does that feel like fun or is that a little nerve wracking? Well, it's fantastic, yeah. It, in, a, in a fighter jet, it's not really a barrel roll, it's more of a snap roll. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Faster, but uh, yeah, we uh, we had the chance to go up and do a, a few maneuvers. The pilot that flies the CEO is that a special job, or they tell the pilot be very careful. This is the CEO, and anytime time that goes wrong, your job is over. We have great test pilots. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and and it, it's 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 nice to go up on one of these tests because you kind of get calibrated. They get you accustomed to the airplane. Now let's take the Boeing plane that most people are probably familiar with, a 737, a 747, yeah. and so forth. On um, those planes, um, can they ever be flown without a pilot? Well, we, we, we're going to continue to have a strong need for pilots. In fact, pilots are in short supply worldwide for commercial airplanes. Uh, that said, we're also continuously working on these autonomous vehicle technologies. So there's a lot of automation already in today's airplanes that can assist the pilot. 
And uh, that technology continues to mature rapidly, right. so we're building it into our future airplanes. So have you ever thought of having the bathrooms in the planes bigger? Because I notice they're really small. You know, you, if you want to change clothes or something to get ready for something else, it's really hard. Has that ever been a problem anybody's mentioned you, yeah. when you design well, these planes? Well, again, our, our airline customers typically select the laboratory geometry, oh, see. and uh, we, we support that. Now, I will say, if, if you'd like to get a BBJ, uh, we could tailor the laboratory oh, really? for you. Okay. So um, more flexibility. Do you have people that can, you can try it out for like six months and see if you like the BBJ before you, you don't have that program? Uh, for, for select customers. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the space program. NASA isn't doing everything it used to do. Mm -hmm. um, is the commercial uh, sector, are you now actually designing the missile, the, the rockets? And what is the plan that you have is to take yeah. a, a rocket to the moon again and to Mars? Yeah. I think this is the most exciting time in, uh, in our country's space program in decades. And uh, we're literally working on things now that are bigger than the Apollo program. I'm not sure it's as well known across the country, but we are in the midst of a space transformation uh, in this country. And uh, the commercial uh, entrants here are adding energy. Uh, we're building a new CST-100 Starliner, which will be the first American-made capsule to get us back to the space station. And we're building the new rocket to Mars with NASA. And uh, this new space launch system, it's a rocket that's about uh, 38 stories tall, about 9.2 million pounds of thrust. If you want to put that in car terms, it's uh, about 207,000 Corvette engines. And uh, we're going to do first test launch here over the next couple of years. Uh, we're going to do a slingshot mission to the moon, return to the moon, set up a lunar gateway, and then we're going to go to Mars. And the first person to step foot on Mars is going to get there on a Boeing rocket. Really? Yeah. Well, they come back on a Boeing rocket. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay, all right. Um, in, now, in, in, uh, in Boeing's uh, version of the space business, but, it's always a two-way trip. Okay. <laughs> but it takes six months to get to Mars, more or less, right? Six months? On that order, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Remember, there was a plane uh, yeah. called the Concorde. Why do we not have a yeah. uh, supersonic transport any longer? Well, it's, it's the economic hurdle that goes with it. That airplane was never economically viable on its own. And uh, to fly supersonic, you burn two to three times as much fuel. I do envision a day where not only will we see commercial airplanes that look like today's airplanes, but we'll see high-speed airplanes that can connect any two cities in the world in about two hours. And then we'll see that span up to uh, space tourism. And uh, eventually, we'll see an economically viable uh, space ecosystem in low Earth orbit. And uh, you'll see an intersection between commercial air travel high-speed travel and space travel, and uh, that's all going to evolve over the next couple of decades. You had a very nice name called Dreamliner. I mean, yeah. if somebody thought that up, it, was, it sounds great. Um, but how come you didn't name your other planes? Like the 747 doesn't have a nice name like that, or yeah. 737. How come you don't have a name for all of them? Yeah. Well, maybe that's something we'll look at okay. in the future. All right. Well, can I get a fee for coming up with that idea <laughs> or something? <laughs> Yeah, we, we could consider that. Okay. Uh, All right. okay. Could be, you know, again, if you want to get into the BBJ market, right. that Maybe. could be some consideration. Well, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I just need a six-month trial. Mm. Let's see. Does your mother ever call you to say, well, she just flew in a plane today, it was a Boeing, and it, this problem was here, or that problem was she doesn't give you advice or anything about Boeing? I only hear those, those kind of complaints when she gets stuck flying on an Airbus. Oh. Um, <laughs> When, uh, yeah, when she flies on a Boeing, mm. I have no problems. Oh, she loves it. She loves it. When you're talking to members of Congress or people in the administration, um, are, what is the biggest concern that you have? Educating them about what you actually do? Right now, trade policy is a, is a really important item for us. And as we think about uh, effective trade agreements around the world, and certainly we want a level playing field around the world. We want to be able to compete and win. We have about 90% of our manufacturing here in the U.S., but we sell about 70% of our products outside the U.S. So think about trade surplus. Uh, the aerospace sector creates the biggest trade surplus of any sector in the country. And so we need trade agreements that allow us to compete globally, to sell globally, and that's part of what creates U.S. manufacturing jobs. So that's an area of discussion, active discussion right now. Well, what about the tariffs? We don't see the current tariffs as having a, a material okay. effect on our business. But it is something we're watching because it's the broader question of 
of trade relationships and effective trade agreements around the world. So you've seen a lot of leaders up front, business leaders, government leaders. What do you think makes a great leader? Well, you know, I, I get to ask that question uh, quite often. I thought often. that was original. Yeah. I thought nobody else ever answered that before. It's a good question. Well, you know, when I, when I uh, look at all the dimensions of being a leader, frankly, it goes back to a lot of what I, I learned uh, growing up on that farm in Iowa. Yeah, I learned a lot from my parents. And uh, the value of hard work, integrity, uh, how you treat other people, how we respect others, our willingness to bring you know, diverse ideas to the table, those all sound simple. And you know, things I learned from my dad, who was never a, a businessman, uh, but they apply in the business world. And I think sticking to those fundamentals and always reminding yourself the importance of integrity, your reputation, how you treat others, and then having an element of being able to inspire you know, those that work around you. And uh, we, we try to codify those at Boeing in, in what we call our enduring values and our Boeing behaviors. Uh, but they get back to those fundamentals of who you are as a person and how you treat others. Now, did your parents live to see your success? Uh, they did. My, my father passed away a couple years ago, but he, he lived a long, robust life. And uh, my mom is uh, still around. And, and I'm never quite sure they knew exactly what I did. Right. And when I started at Boeing, uh, of course, coming from the farm, I started at Boeing my, as an engineer. And my dad would often ask me, say, so Dennis, uh, how'd it go today? You know, what'd you do? And uh, I'd describe it, and you know, he would kind of get it. And uh, you know, I was designing airplanes. It was real stuff. And then as I got to more elevated positions, got to executive positions, he asked me the same questions. Like, Dennis, what would you do today? And I'd describe it, and you know, I was excited about it. And he would pause and say, well, Dennis, what did you actually do today? Right. <laughs> oh. It was a good reminder. Right? Does your mother ever call you to say, well, she's just flew in a plane today, it was a Boeing, and it, this problem was here, or that problem was she doesn't give you advice or anything about Boeing? I only hear those, those kind of complaints when she gets stuck flying on an Airbus. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now, yeah, when she flies on a Boeing. Mm. Have no problems. Oh, she loves it. She loves it. You have never actually been bike racing. You don't do racing, do you? You just oh, do I, riding. I, I, I compete in quite a few races. I, I love long distance uh, century races. So. You go against people who are in their 20s or? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. So eventually you would like to see your legacy be what? When you ultimately <clears throat> retire and you'd go to bike racing yeah. full time. <laughs> well, you know, I'll let others uh, determine legacy. But uh, you know, what's important to me in terms of reputation is, is one, I want to be known as somebody who, who invests in people, right? A leader who really invests in people and talent and takes that seriously and, and raise the level of the team. Uh, this uh, theme of innovation, right? Innovating for our second century and that we made the changes we needed to make to you know, disrupt ourselves and, and, and bring the right technology, innovation to stay on the leading edge. And then I uh, also talked to my team a lot about continuing to raise the bar for ourselves, not only to be the, the best in aerospace, which is you know, an important measure for us, but to be a global industrial yeah. champion and to continue to scale up at that level. So you know, those are a few of the characteristics of the company I'd like to see when my time is done. So have you ever thought that the Wright brothers, they were actually bicycle manufacturers? You got it. That's a and great connection. Have you ever thought maybe Boeing could make some bicycles? Uh, I've been thinking about that. Now, actually, <laughs> Not a high actually, margin, I know. With, but my, with my friends over at, uh, at Trek, uh, I've uh, worked on a Project One bike with them, which is a specialty right. bike using aerospace technology with a Boeing Centennial paint job. Uh, that is my favorite bicycle. So there, there is an intersection between aerospace and cycling. Well, um, maybe I'll take up cycling if you have, you have like the, the little bells on it and uh, the brakes and uh, I'll get the you mirrors. Bells and I, need basket. I need all that. I need a basket. I need everything. <laughs> So, um, look, Dennis, um, you're obviously a very accomplished executive. You've done a great job for Boeing and its shareholders. I wish I had bought the stock when you mm. took over, but uh, I guess it's still a good deal. Still a good deal. Yeah. Thank you very much for everything you've done. Thanks, David.